And the final section, oh, uh, man seeking uh, man, woman seeking woman, and the gender spectrum. Uh, two topics I've been talking about for 30 years now, uh, pretty much saying the same thing. So let's talk about women seeking women, men seeking men, uh, person seeking person. What I'm talking about is uh, same-sex behavior, uh, uh, people who are gay or lesbians. And when we talk about this issue, person seeking person, and when we talk about the gender spectrum, uh, you know, we come back to the naturalistic fallacy, but not really the naturalistic fallacy. I like to say people are trying to play the naturalistic fallacy in reverse. Uh, they're going to say, well, you know, same-sex behavior, gender spectrum, we don't really see this. You know, it's men and, men and women get married. Uh, it's there are men and women. That's what it's most of. That's what's more around. So therefore, that's what's more natural. And again, what they're trying to do is just basically put the good old naturalistic fallacy in a new wrapper and saying that, well, just because, you know, half the population is not gay, that means that gay is wrong or something. And that's a fallacy. It's not true. And so let's talk about that. Okay, so uh, straight or gay, uh, you know, we can begin by talking about Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey, back in the 40s, uh, was one of the first sex researchers. Uh, he was a biologist who was kind of pressed into, not that unwillingly, into sex research. And uh, one of the things he developed was the Kinsey scale of sexuality, leading from uh, this zero, where people are totally heterosexual, to six people who are totally homosexual or lesbians or gay. And what he was trying to say by this is that it's not an issue of straight or gay, but there's a lot of variability between. And for example, people who are Kinsey zeros uh, have never had sex with a member of their own gender and generally do not see a you know, feel attraction to a member of their own gender. Uh, people with a Kinsey score of one uh, uh, have uh, been exclusively heterosexual, uh, but they may have in their past had a minor uh, you know, sexual relationship with a member of their own gender, uh, leading to a three, uh, where people who are uh, bisexual and have attractions and have had relationships with members of their own sex and members of the other sex, uh, to six, people who are exclusively heterosexual have never had sex with a member of the opposite sex and generally don't feel attractive to members of the opposite sex. So his point was that it's not an all or nothing thing. There are degrees. And that's more important to think about. You know, it's more important to think about, uh, you know, being straight or gay, not as an either or situation, uh, but degrees. And so let's plug in some numbers to this. Kinsey, back in 1948, uh, said that 37% uh, of the of men he surveyed were not uh, Kinsey zeros. That is, 37% of the men had at least some same-sex experience. A third of all men have had at least one incident of having sex with another man. Uh, this was probably artificially inflated accidentally by Kinsey based on his method. Uh, so we can talk about current trustworthy statistics. Uh, the National Center for Health Statistics in 2002 uh, they said that among men, 1.8% say they're bisexual, 2.3% say they're homosexual, 4% say they're something else. So that's about five or six, right, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven or eight percent that says that they are not straight. And among women, it's 2.8% are bisexual, 1.3% are homosexual, and 3.8% something else. Uh, the Janus report in 93, 5% uh, of the men said they were bi bisexual, 4% homosexual, 3% of the women said they're bisexual, 
2% homosexual. So this is not a minor thing or a non-existent thing. Uh, a good 8 or 9 or 10% of the population are not exclusively straight. Oh, by the way, uh, my uh, title, Straight or Gay, how did I come up with that? Some of you may know. Uh, so one of the arguments about homosexual behavior is that, well, evolutionarily, you know, in terms of evolution, it doesn't make sense. Because if you have sex with a member of your own sex, nobody's getting pregnant, so those genes are not passing on to the future generation. And while that sounds like a good uh, idea, it's specious, that is, it's false. Uh, researchers have been zeroing in on the idea over the last 10 years uh, in terms of research and research results that genes that promote gay sexual behavior in men promote success, uh, successful reproduction in women. What? What that means is uh, the heterosexual sisters of gay men, because they're genetically related, they are sexier to men and more successful with men. So while that gene may be disadvantageous to a gay man, it is advantageous to the heterosexual women who have it. And so that's why the gene still exists, uh, because it is super advantageous for women and mildly disadvantageous to men who have it. And the same is true of lesbians. Uh, the heterosexual brothers of lesbians are more successful with women. Uh, and so generally we see that the thinking is there is this uh, super gene that is so powerful in making you sexually attractive to members of the opposite sex that when it shows up in your brother, uh, it you know you know makes him gay, but that still makes it a very viable gene for everybody to have. Okay, and then things got set on its head when Wendo et al. in 2018 did a very massive and specific study where they were looking at the actual genes that predispose men to uh, gay sex and the genes that predispose you to gay sex are associated with genes that increase the number of heterosexual partners you have. This occurs across individuals and also in the same individual. That is, a gene that predisposes you to want to have sex with other members of your same sex also is associated with your success in terms of the number of sexual partners of the other sex. So to say it again, gay men, if they have this gene, they're going to be very successful gay men and having lots of partners with other men, but they're also going to have lots of women partners, women sexual partners, and the gene is driving both of these things. And so this illustrates how even to the individual, even within the individual, having uh, these genes that predispose you to gay sex is actually adaptive. And uh, another thing people talk about when they talk about uh, you know, uh, same-sex behavior and same-sex lifestyles is same-sex parents. And they say, well, wouldn't that mean that your children are going to be more likely to be a lesbian or gay? No. Research shows conclusively that children raised by same-sex parents, either natural children or adoptive children, are not more likely to be LGBTQ uh, than if they were raised by, uh, you know, uh, non-gay uh, parents. Uh, also, well, children are more likely to suffer from emotional disorders if they're raised by same-sex parents. No, the research shows that is untrue. It's very clear that the number of emotional disorders that children raised by gay parents is the same as the number of emotional disorders of children raised by straight parents. There is one difference. Uh, children uh, raised in uh, you know, LGBTQ households are more likely the target of bullying, bullying, which is not 
the parents' problems or the children's problems, but society's problems. Or society's problem, sorry. And then, uh, so that's it for that. Let's move on to the gender spectrum, because we don't have that much time. We need to end the semester. Time's running out. Uh, what I've been teaching for my whole career, this is nothing new. Okay, so we can talk about gender identity. Gender identity is your sense of gender. Uh, it develops around the age of 18 months to two years. Uh, your gender identity is this. It's your understanding of what your gender is. Are you a male or a female? Uh, it is also your definition of what gender is. That is, what is a male and what is a female? And then finally, the final element of gender identity is your sense of permanence. That, oh, I'm a, I'm a boy self. And boys have peepees, and at 18 months, that's the definition. And I'm not going to wake up as a girl tomorrow. I'm going to say a boy the rest of my life. And that's gender identity. At 18 months of age, you got to remember, this is, the child is not really thinking at a high level cognitively. And a lot of people talk about gender identity as being ineffable, that is, unverbalizable. That is, you just know this. And we only get this understanding of what it is by questioning kids uh, and in making inferences. And so that's what gender identity is. It's something that happens very early in your life, 18 months. And it's something that's really not that conscious. You're not sitting around saying, oh yeah, if I'm a boy, then my life opportunities are this. And if I'm a girl, my life opportunities are this. It's not really that conscious. It's just a, a gut feeling, more or less. And that's OK. And so for most of us, we make the determination that I'm a boy, and I'm going to stay a boy, and that's how I feel deep down. Or I'm a girl, and I'm going to stay a girl, and that's how I feel deep down. But then in some cases, people, or children, I should say, at 18 months of age, they have this sense of, wait a second, I don't fit into these categories. Uh, people tell me I'm a boy, but I don't feel, in, you know, I have a penis, but I don't really feel that way. And again, since this is an ineffable feeling, yeah, it's, it's more feelings than anything else. Or you know, people tell me I'm a girl, but I really don't feel like I'm one or the other. And this is at 18 months. And so uh, this is when people are on different parts of the middle of the gender spectrum, and we call them transsexual. And transsexuals are when their sense of gender identity does not correspond with the biological birth agenda, uh, gender. They may appear male or female, but they're internally uncomfortable with that definition. Uh, they may uh, dress as a different gender, or they may go through different levels of surgical transition. I originally in this lecture talked about stages. They, they're going through stages to go to a final surgical transition. But I've learned since then that stages is the wrong way to talk about it. They may be at different levels because not all transgender people will complete a surgical transition to another gender. Some people will transition partial, partially and then feel, hey, this is what I really feel deep down, and then they stop. That is, some guys uh, will start to transition, and they'll have their penis, but they'll take hormone therapy, and they'll still have their penis, and it'll get really small, but then they say, hey, right at this moment, I feel great as a gender. This is where I want to be. And so they'll, that's where they stay forever. Some people will go through to the whole uh, transformation, and they'll dress as a woman and have their penis removed and have uh, plastic surgery to get breasts and to get a labia. Uh, but others will stay at some level of that, you know, uh, some part of that spectrum. 
So it's not that they're going to transition all the way automatically. They're going to transition until they know they're at the right place for themselves. So what's it like to be transgender? Uh, in America today, it's not that good. Uh, you know, the data on discrimination against transgender people is just uh, horrible. Uh, you know, 57 percent of all transgender people talk about how their family chose not to speak with them or spend time with them. Uh, Fifty percent of all transgender people talk about being harassed or bullied at school. Uh, Fifty to sixty percent talk about being uh, discriminated against at work. Sixty percent talk about how healthcare providers refuse refuse to treat them for general uh, healthcare uh, issues. Uh, people, transgender people, have suffered uh, physical or sexual violence at work and at school. Uh, you know, two thirds to over two thirds have suffered physical or sexual violence. Uh, Again, more than half have suffered harassment because of their gender uh, by law enforcement officers. Uh, again, that many or more have suffered physical or sexual violence by law, legal officers. Probably because of all these things, 41% uh, of all transgender people said that they have attempted suicide. The normal U.S. or the average U.S. suicide rate is less than 1% of attempting suicide. Uh, so uh, it is a horrible thing. Transgender people are either being killed or killing themselves at an alarming rate. Uh, and it is, you know, almost you could talk about a genocide uh, because of the discrimination our culture uh, holds for transgender people. Uh, you know, and what transgender people need is they need to know that people support them. Uh, a survey of 13-year-old to 24-year-old, so teenage LGBTQ youth, not just uh, the transsexual, but those who identify as bisexual, gay, lesbians, or queer, uh, that is having a gender identity that is uh, not the norm. Uh, 30,000 of these were surveyed and they looked at their uh, attempted suicide rate. Uh, for those who had one accepting adult in their life, the suicide rate was 17, the attempted suicide rate was 17 percent. Uh, for those who had no accept, accepting adults, uh, it was nearly a third. And so it's very important for adults to accept LG BTQ uh, people, and I want my students to know that I accept you, and that I'm at least one that have accepted you, and all my life have accepted LGBTQ people. And uh, so let's talk about some of the research about this. And of course, what I'm going to do is tell you any prejudice you have about this is you know wrong, like I did with uh, you know. Uh, you know, homosexuality or gay lesbianism and bisexuality. So let's talk about the intersex biology. Uh, this is us. You know, of course, uh, it doesn't look like this. It's all wound up together uh, in a nucleus of a cell, but this is our uh, chromosomes. And there's 23 of them, 22 like this, and then the sex chromosomes. This is XX, so this is a girl. Maybe, maybe not. We'll talk about that in a minute. That is XX uh, is uh, female, XY is male, usually. Usually because we can talk about all of the syndromes in which you are not either XX or XY or not phenotypically the same as your genotype. Uh, Kleinfelder syndrome, uh, where you have XXY, you have an extra chromosome. Uh, so you have two X's, so you're female, but then you have an XY, you're male. What happens? Uh, these are males, and they are pretty much males, and they have smaller testicles than normal. I believe they are actually fertile, and they can uh, have children. 
Uh, this occurs 1 in 1,000 births, so it's not that rare at all. Androgen insensitivity syndrome, uh, 1 in 13,000 births. Uh, you're an XY female, uh, that is, your body is insensitive to the hormone that the Y chromosome instructs your body to produce to make it into a male body. And so you, you grow up, your body develops as a female, but you don't have uh, appropriately developed uh, uterus, and you cannot give birth. Partial androgen and sensitivity syndrome, uh, XY females with an underdeveloped sexual, uh, secondary sexual organs. So you're a female, uh, you really don't have wide hips or large breasts, and other things about your body in terms of like uh, the shading under your eyes are not really that female, uh, but you don't have any uh, primary male sexual organs, you don't have a penis, you don't have testes, but you're an XY. Uh, adrenal hypoplasia, very common, 1 in 66. XX women who can give birth, uh, but they have underdeveloped secondary organs. Uh, that is, uh, something is going wrong and they are somehow being exposed as a uh, fetus uh, to uh, androgen, that is male hormone, and so again, underdeveloped sex, you know, sexual organs, secondary organs, they're not that womanly in terms of how they look, uh, but they can give birth. And then one of the more recent uh, things discovered, the SRY gene. Uh, this is the Y gene on the Y, this is the gene on the Y chromosome uh, that, uh, you know, has the instructions to produce androgen to make uh, the fetus male. Now, uh, this gene uh, could be on the X chromosome, so you could be XX, and with the SRY gene you could still be uh, phenotypically a male and have children as a male. Uh, or it could be on the Y gene and turned off or on. It doesn't, you know, it really pops around like that. The thing is, you could be an XX, and what does that mean? You're, you're a woman, or maybe not, because you could be XX, and you could have the SRY gene on one of your X chromosomes, and you could be a male right now, and you could have had a child, and if we do a genetic test on you, hey, this says that you're a woman. Ooh, whoa. Uh, some, you know, biologists, you know, when they teach about this in lab courses, you, know, you say, well, do you have people like uh, do the SRI test on themselves? And the professors say, no way, man, because what we don't, what I'm unable to do, because I'm a biologist, not a psychologist, is deal with the aftermath of somebody learning that they lived all their lives as a woman, and now they discover that their genes are XY. Uh, some orange person has said that they want to, uh, you know, make it a law so that uh, whatever uh, gender is on your birth certificate has to be, and on your driver's license and whatever, uh, you know, gender that you live your life by has to be uh, based on a genetic test. Well, if we do that, a whole lot of people who think they're males are going to be XX, and a whole lot of people who think they're females are going to be XY. Okay, so as I said before, you know, what if you really are a guy and you're XX? And you could have kids depending upon what uh, caused you uh, to become a male. What if you're a woman and you're XY and you could be fertile, but you're XY? Uh, what would it mean if you aren't what you expected? Or really does it matter? And so when some orange person talks about we need to talk about a person's gender based on, uh, you know, the results of a genetic test, you start to see how little sense that makes. Uh, so that's really not that important. Oh, and that's the end of uh, our lecture, the end of our semester.
uh, a meme I, I just really love because this has been my whole professional life. Can't tell if it's feminist trash or academic social psychology doctrine. People, uh, the things I've been teaching for 40 years, uh, people call it now feminist trash, but it's really not. This is what social psychologists have known for a long time. All right, uh, enjoyed class. I'll see you in the synchronous section. Bye-bye.